Welcome everybody in the classroom. We are actually 10 people gathered today. It's really nice, new exotic thing to be Po Platz in Lund. And welcome to the online audience as well to the Sound Studies lecture series number two. And today I would like to introduce you to uh, Marcel Kurbusen, who's standing here right next to me. Uh, Marcel is professor of music philosophy, sound studies and artistic research in at the Leiden University in the Netherlands and at the Orpheus Institute in Belgium. Besides from that, he's the editor of the Journal of Sonic Studies. Uh, it's based in the Netherlands, but it's very uh, international known uh, journal on yeah, sound studies. So have a look at that as well. And I think Marcel has a passion for football, but fortunately he's not going to speak about that today, but he will speak about engaging with everyday Watch sounds. <laughs> Welcome, Marcel. Thank you. Getting quite nervous in front of such an audience, <coughs> but um, I guess you all know the first two sentences of um, the book uh, Thousand Plateaus by uh, uh, Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari. Uh, we wrote this book together, is the first sentence. And since each of us are several, we are already quite a crowd. So that, let that be the motto for today as well. <coughs> um, yeah, besides what uh, Sanna already uh, said about me, is uh, before I became a professor of auditory culture, uh, I was a jazz pianist and um, I studied uh, cultural studies and philosophy. My dissertation was, um, well, the, the, the key phrase there was that I wrote around music <coughs> instead of about, which for me was a very important difference. Um, but my general interest by that time was in the role and function and position that music has in contemporary society. Um, so my main things that I dealt with was what can music do uh, as music? What can it contribute to, for example, contemporary philosophy, to ethics, to spirituality? There should be now a change. Ah, yes, there it is. <coughs> um, in 2017, I wrote an EPUB on improvisation. And um, the large part of uh, that is a contribution of improvisation in music on topics such as freedom, management, complexity theories, and politics. So I try to make improvised music productive for these kind of issues which are happening actually outside of the music. So that's why I that's how I wanted to, s to make clear that music has more to offer to a society than mere entertainment. Now, despite the ubiquity of music, uh, everywhere you can hear music, you can listen to it all times uh, a day to every type of music you want to listen to. Um, I made, not so long ago, maybe some 10 years, um, I made a change from music to sounds. Uh, and that change went for me gradually. Uh, started listening to electronic music, then to sound art, and then finally I thought, okay, maybe this art is also not so interesting anymore or relevant or necessary, let's just listen to sounds. And <coughs> I got especially interested in everyday sounds, sounds that surround us on a daily basis. Now, since 2016, I'm full professor of um, auditory culture with a specialty or my research is about sounds in public urban spaces um, and ac actually especially the role that artists can play in redesigning public urban spaces. Um, and that's the end of my introduction then, F from September 2020 till September 21. So that's only a couple of, uh, well, actually 
No, it's still, uh, well, since 1st of September, so that's some 30, years, uh, 30 uh, days ago, uh, I had a sabbatical and I worked on a new EPUB, um, which is not about everyday sounds in public spaces uh, only, but predominantly, uh, and it has really nothing to do with COVID. It was just by accident uh, that I was concentrating on everyday sounds at home. Uh, now, why this EPUB? Um, because it is my conviction that knowledge can take place or can be conveyed on many different levels in many different forms. So this EPUB contains text, it contains audio files, field recordings, and it contains visuals. And actually this picture that you see there, this new bright idea, is the picture that should be on the cover of the forthcoming EPUB. Um, Although <clears throat> the textual parts might prevail in quantity, I do consider the three levels as equally important and relevant. Even stronger, I would say that the text provide a context for the uh, audiovisual materials. Um, yeah, so. This is how the EPUB, uh, I hope that you can somehow see it or read it. This is uh, how the EPUB is, uh, is organized. So I will basically talk about my, this book uh, today. Um, part one and two, so the introduction and framing, they, will, they provide a context. Um, as you can see, perhaps um, part two, so we are already a bit into the book, there comes a section on disclaimers. So what I try to do also is to things that are usually kept out of the content of the book, I took them in. So it is only after a while that you suddenly are confronted with things that I needed to say what I'm doing, what I'm not doing actually, which is quite, a, so that's the most extensive chapter of the book actually, because there's a lot I'm not doing. Um, but um, uh, before we go on, um, this is how the, the part one, the introduction, and the first thing starts. So that's how the EPUB starts. Welcome, my name is Marcel Kobese and I'm the composer, the curator, the bricoleur of this publication. It consists of a multimedia account of a journey I have undertaken over the course of approximately one year. Primarily a listening journey across many spaces in several geographical places in order to gain more insight into everyday sounds, how we affect them and how they affect us, even though we often ignore or simply don't notice them. Just as we influence and co-create our sonic environment, the sounds surrounding us have an influence on us, on our behavior, on our feelings and emotions, on our identity. So, right from the start, I would like to emphasize that, for me, the world is not organized into intentional subjects, humans, and passive objects, things sounds. Instead, it is inhabited by ethological bodies of events, 
affects and relations. Devoting a complete publication to something as lowbrow as everyday sounds may seem a bit uncalled for or pointless. However, I cling to an observation by the German sociologist Georg Simmel, who writes, and I paraphrase here, that even an ugly phenomenon can be encountered in such a way that it becomes worthwhile, meaningful and valuable. To involve ourselves deeply and lovingly with even the most common things or events, which might at first strike us as banal and repulsive, enables us, Simmel states, to conceive of them as worthy of our attention, our care, our receptivity. Words in which aesthetic as well as ethical, ecological as well as political overtones resonate. Enacting new patterns of engagement with everyday sounds. Perhaps this is, in the most general terms, the aim of this epoch. Resserrez-le en tirant sur la bande élastique et respirez normalement. Secure it with the elastic band and breathe normally. So, um, preparing for this um, seminar, Sana asked me to send in a photo, and I don't know if you have seen that um, um, announcement or invitation, but it's a photo of a teaspoon. And now why did I select that photo? That has to do with a quote I read when starting this EPUB, a quote from uh, the French author Georges Perec. And I'm quoting a small um, part of um, what he has written. What we need to question is bricks, concrete, glass, our table, manners, our utensils, our tools, the way we spend our time, our rhythms. Question your teaspoons. Well, Question your teaspoons. That is what Perec is asking from us. So how, how, how should I question teaspoons? By listening to them, by exploring their affordances as sounding objects, or by somehow challenging their affordances. That's where it started. In part three, you see that uh, I dig into the familiarity of everyday sounds. So simply raising awareness of the sounds that surround us on a daily basis. Although there is a trap, I will come to back to that later. Part four is the unfamiliarity of everyday sounds. There's a kind of turning point at a certain moment Raising awareness of everyday sounds leads to a kind of alienation. And you start discovering the unfamiliar aspects of familiar sounds. Part five is about the political, the social and economic meaning, impact and role of everyday sounds. Actually, that, is, that could be considered as the core because that is why I'm interested in it, because everyday sounds have a lot more to say than what you hear on the superficial level. And part six, the coda, um, where also there is inserted the acknowledgements. So also part of the book itself and not, you know, like in between the inside and outside of the book. Um, there I reflect on the role of field recordings and sound walking in and around the home uh, and how they stimulate our listening and increase an awareness of the roles that sound plays in everyday life. And from there, from this stimulation to listen, there's a step, next step to, the, to intervention, to sonic interventions, to improve or to alter our everyday sonic environment. And that's what I call non-art. It's art-like, 
but it never gets the status of an artwork. Now, in part two till five, you will find, well, I call them excursus, excursus on sonic materialism. Uh, they are more philosophically abstract, uh, so it's more a deeper thinking. Well, pff, as far as I'm capable of doing that, um, uh, about so it's it's not so much about everyday sounds, but more about can can we build on these reflections of the everyday sounds a more profound theory on sonic materialism. As I said, all almost all these texts contain audio files. Uh, photos or both. Uh, the relation between text, photos and audio is not always crystal clear. Um, and that's done deliberately. Um, some of the audio files have a recurring theme, a light motif, and that's what you heard in the very beginning, what I played on the piano. Very simple motif. Um, that is sometimes recurring uh, throughout the audio files. Uh, what I will do now is to go a little bit more into detail uh, about what I try to write, and I will focus on the text that maybe you have at least uh, received, maybe also read. Uh, so I will concentrate on uh, the text that I provided, which are the texts that here are in the table of contents are um, done in red. So, the first one. Um, I try to be very systematic in the sense that, um, yeah, what's actually the objective of this EPUB? Uh, what is the point of departure or the hypothesis? Well, simply that sounds mediate relationships between human, non-humans, and the environment. That's point of departure. Um, and one of the objectives objectives is to investigate how listening to familiar and less familiar sounds create effective relationships to places, to these environments. Well, it's not very surprising, but that's the idea what I had in mind. Another objective is to explore various listening attitudes. Attitudes in which emotions, knowledge, reflection, and engagement interlace with routine actions and habits. And I also claim that there is an ethical imperative to listen critically to the world around us. Why is that so? For example, to resist the idea of the world as mainly a material resource or a commodity. So learning to listen to everyday sounds is a step, in my opinion, towards a social, political and ecological responsibility. And I mean that in a literal sense, the ability to respond. And what I won't discuss today, but what I think is very important, that also non-human, so also just matter, is able to respond also on a social, political, and ethical, and ecological way. So, every being has a responsibility, an ability to respond. And this makes a critical evaluation possible. So you can either go for protection or develop alternatives. So far about the objectives, what about the method? How to engage? with everyday sounds. For me, it's a matter of participation, which means that gaining insight is specific, experiential, contingent. By which I mean that I try to understand the world from within, as being a part of it, instead of reflecting on the world, which is far more common for academics, to, in, uh, reflect on the world from the outside, from a distance. And I call that a performative understanding of everyday sounds. Performative understanding of everyday sounds. 
which means an active intertwining of perceiving, feeling, thinking, and making. Okay, and how can this performative understanding materialize, become concrete? So where can this perceiving, feeling, thinking, and making intertwine? In this EPUB, the focus will be on, or is, on field recordings. That is how I think that this feeling, thinking, perceiving, and making come together by making field recordings. Hi, it's me again. I just wanted to say that as this publication also includes several field recordings, it feels necessary to offer a brief reflection on their status. Their status here in this EPUB, as well as in general. So these, these field recordings, which capture the recordists, so in this case mine, auditory perspective, uh, presenting it as a situated interplay between embodied, relational, sensory, and cognitive processes of producing the sonic environment. So in other words, field recordings don't represent a pre-existing reality. What they do is they establish an effective encounter and engagement with forces or agents that constitute this side. So listening to the recorded material stimulates perhaps a closer listening, discovering hidden sonic qualities and possibilities of a place. So it is not that the site already exists, but comes into existence through my listening, through my recording, because I'm relating with it. Um, and connected to this, to these re short reflections on field recording is, uh, I will discuss one of these interludes uh, on sonic materialism. Um, so I define my work as auditory onto-epistemology. So a way of engaging with the sonic environment and technology and engaging with the sonic environment through technology uh, and simultaneously acknowledging the role of listening as giving meaning to what is heard. So the auditory Onto epistemology refers to knowing in and through sound. To sounding, on the one hand, to what sounds, on the one hand, and the embodied, situated experience of sound. The knowledge production, that is the result of it, this knowledge production in and through sound, implies an interaction with a dynamic environment and I'm stressing the word dynamic here if only because as a researcher you are also and the field recorders you are also simultaneously co-creating that environment uh, the sounds that you are producing or the way you are recording means that actually you are creating that environment it doesn't again it doesn't pre-exist this brings me to the next part um, 
as I said already, dealing with the famili familiarity of everyday sounds immediately um, brought me into contact, confronted me with a trap. Because in dealing with familiar sounds, that is by deliberately paying attention to them, this sonic familiarity disappears. It slips away. Because the power of familiar sounds is exactly that they go pass by unnoticed. And they occur at the periphery of our attention or perception. So there's a dilemma here. How do we deal with everyday sounds and listen to those sounds in everyday situations and without transforming them while doing that, while listening to them? That is the dilemma that I was facing. And actually the rest of the book is somehow trying to answer that question. Um, well, there's no final answer to it, but I'm trying to come back to that every now and then and trying to bring this thinking just a little bit further. Um, and I'm, I do it already in this chapter, it's the first attempt. So a possible way out of this dilemma is to make a distinction between deliberately developing a heightened awareness of everyday sounds, so trying to put all your attention to these everyday sounds, versus learning to experience how, why and where you are affected by them. So for me the latter is a listening at the edge of conscious attention. So it is not really that you listen with full attention to what is going on in these sounds. But on the, on the other hand, you are somehow aware or you learn to be aware that they affect you and that you affect them. Now, um, I, I had to deal with that dilemma again in an audio file I was... Uh, I was working on at that time, um, and it's it's an audio file. It it it's a ten minute audio file. I, I nevertheless I want to play it in total for you, uh, but it comes with a small a small assignment for for you. Um, so first, it is about a sound walk, a sound walk in my neighborhood. In I'm living in the southern part of Rotterdam. That's the tough part, the hard part. Um, so, I mean, you can be happy that I'm still alive, basically, um, or maybe not. <laughs> uh, that, I mean, that you're not happy that I'm alive, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I, I want you to do two things. Uh, first, to make a drawing of the route, so to visualize that somehow, and then simply in some keywords, write down what you hear. That's it. V very, very simple. Um, it is December 21, 2020. It's time to go outside. First, because everyday sounds, of course, cannot only be found at home. And second, because the notion of home also refers to those spaces where we can feel at home. In other words, it is important to distinguish between the primarily physical structure of the house and the more socio-cultural dimensions of home. So, let me take you on a short virtual sonic walk through my neighborhood.
So by assembling this uh, selection of, for me, ordinary sounds and presenting them as an audio file, that is, by separating the sounds from their normal contacts, the everyday is already disregarded. It's disregarded in favor of a more imaginative engagement. You can only use your imagination and, you know, like in your head, create a route that I have been walking and perhaps even you didn't, you didn't even recognize all the sounds that were played. So, for example, shopping or pile driving or driving become musical activities. Going to the market, for me, became like attending a concert. And bringing such sounds to our attention, to my attention at least, means to not neglect them, to not deny them critical reflection. So perhaps, perhaps I de every day them. Perhaps I transform them. But if the everyday indeed suffers from neg negligence, eh, from not being noticed anymore, then a certain rescuing is needed. For example, to delve into the social, political, ecological and ethical powers of everyday sounds. That's the topic of the other part. But before going there, some reflections on the unfamiliarity of everyday sounds. Because besides the dilemma that something something is, so besides the dilemma I was facing that the familiarity is immediately defamiliarized, something else happens when dealing with these everyday sounds. Yeah? The everyday encompasses both the ordinary and the extraordinary, both the known and the unknown. And there I um, take inspiration from uh, Michel de Certeau, um, who is reflecting and thinking about the everyday practices and how they are always already permeated by a certain resistance. As sim the simple reusing and recombining of materials, he calls it a kind of improvisation, implies already a critical response to the imposed order or the imposed system. So perhaps these sounds or these things, these everyday things, are created with a certain purpose in our using them, we all also use them for other purposes. So that is what he understands by resistance. In that sense, he says, a full colonization of daily life is impossible. And in that sense, I understand the everyday as always extraordinary as well. And especially through decontextualization of sounds uh, in the audio files, familiar sounds can be heard otherwise. Again, also because the imagination starts to play a role. So actually what this listening and dealing with these familiar everyday sounds uh, becomes is a traveling back and forth between recognition, imagination, associating, etc etc what one more audio file brief one this time well um, that is si simple question is can you detect what kind of sound uh, that I'm playing here I often walk from my house to the nearby river for a coffee in a cafe I know the route very well the sonic ambience, although never quite the same, is so familiar that I usually don't pay too much attention. However, on this rather windy afternoon in October, 
I suddenly heard a sound I never heard before. After standing still and listening more carefully, it took me some time to detect where it was coming from. The sound fascinated me, so I made a brief recording. Um, so, as a kind of recap, the idea of this book was in the first place to invest the role of everyday sounds in everyday life. And in my opinion, these everyday sounds have a strong impact on our behavior, on our experiences, how we use things, etc. In other words, <coughs> they play a role in the social, political and ethical relations of humans to other humans, to non-humans and to the environment. And as our connection to everyday sounds takes pr primarily place through listening, um, I also include one text on listening. On listening in relation to the political, to the social, to the ethical. Um, very briefly, first point I'm trying to make is that listening is always already politically and ethically charged. Simply because listening always is also an act of in and exclusion. And certain sounds are privileged. Your emphasis on particular sounds and thereby necessarily excluding other things that you hear. The second thought that I'm trying to develop a little bit in this EPUB is that an emphasis on attentive, on careful and respectful listening, let's say the listening that we usually do when listening to music, or at least attempt to do, excludes other more practical kinds of listening. For example, orally recognizing a place, detecting acoustic alerts, distracted or background listening. And so the one is excluded at the expense of the other. Now, my question is, is there a reconciliation possible between this ordinary listening and the extraordinary listening? Uh, the extraordinary listening being this attentive, careful and respectful listening. Is there a kind of reconciliation possible there? Can listening be simultaneously open, respectful and careful, as well as distracted, practical and mundane? In order to think about that 
a little bit more, I coined the concept listening traveling. By which I mean that sometimes we follow the sound, sometimes we return to what was heard before. Sometimes we lose ourselves in sound worlds that exist only within ourselves. Sometimes we anticipate what will be heard. Sometimes we perceive the source. Sometimes we register things or events hidden from view. So listening traveling contains attention, distraction, imagination, memories, associations, etc. So perhaps this is the possibility I'm coming up with to avoid the trap that I, that I was talking about earlier. Uh, the trap where the, when you listen attentively to the familiar sounds immediately you create an unfamiliarity. Maybe by, by this combination of how we actually are usually listening, li this listening traveling, which encompasses ev every kind of listening, per perhaps that is trying, it's there that there is a, perhaps a possibility to avoid the trap of simply reducing the familiarity to the unfamiliar. It brings me to my last part. So again, the aim of this EPUB was to develop a re-sensitization to the acoustic environment while remaining, and that is, that is what I can add now, while remaining as much as possible in the quotidian situation. And therefore, I suggest this oscillation between different listening regimes. And I've tried to achieve that by presenting audio files to stimulate a readiness for listening to the everyday environment. And to stimulate this readiness should be understood not as an attentive listening, eh, but as this listening traveling. Now, the effect of raising such an awareness through this listening traveling might range from appreciation to rejection of certain sounds. You can think, oh wow, this is beautiful. Like in, in my previous sound file that I thought, oh, I never heard it before, but this is a great sound. Or I can reject it. I think, okay, now I listen carefully or more or less carefully to these sounds, attentively, more or less. I think, well, this is, this is terrible, our sonic environment. We should change it. So either we can protect it and think, oh, we should keep it like it is. We this shouldn't change. Or we should maybe try to alter it, for example, by sonic interventions. And if we choose for the latter, for these sonic interventions, I use the term non-art, or this non between brackets. So although a sonic intervention can be appreciated aesthetically, they need not be artistic in an institutionalized sense. The interventions, uh, sorry, the intentions to intervene can be pragmatically rather than artistically driven. Simply, for example, to mask or reduce influences of disruptive sounds. But also here, and that will be my final word for today, perhaps it's better not to create a dichotomy between the aesthetic and the practical, but I think in these sonic interventions, the aesthetic and the practical can be regarded as almost completely integrated. This is the last part or the last page of my EPUB. Uh, I owe you one thing. 
And that is this. September 1, 2020, 7 hours, 19 minutes, and 33 seconds, to be precise. My journey has come to a temporary end, and it ends where it started, here in my kitchen, right after my breakfast. It started and it ends with questioning teaspoons. Questioning them by making, as Lyotard says, a little clearing where the penumbra of an almost given will be able to enter and modify its contour. Questioning them by exploring them sonically in various situations and interactions. Would you like some Thank you.